with Scott Zimmerman and my lovely co-host Ryan. We're back. Last week's live didn't work out, so thanks so much for joining us here. Hopefully my internet connection in El Salvador is stable enough to make this through, but this is a conversation I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, Scott is a optics engineer, a lighting expert, and is now pioneering his own company called Nira uh, to build better lighting. And we're going to talk all about how light affects our biology, maybe specifically more about near infrared light and, and melatonin. But before we get into that, Scott, how are you doing today? Thanks so much for coming on. I'm doing great. And thank you for having me on. So maybe to start, um, as an optics engineer, you know, there's there's really not a lot of engineers who understand electromagnetism and understand biology. Uh, and I pride myself in being at least someone who sort of understands both topics. And my question to you is, how did you get intrigued to take a deeper dive into how light is affecting our biology? Well, you know... <clears throat> When I first got looking around, I was looking, I've been in the area for 40 years. I've got 85 patents issued in the area of displays and lighting. But I got started working on uh, looking for a new kind of, you know, healthier lighting. Because I got kind of interested. I actually went up and talked to Hamlin and some of the other people in the photobiomodulation space. And it became clear to me that some of the levels that they were exposing the patients to and getting results, biological effects were typical uh, in the near infrared were typical of what we would see in a well-lit incandescent room and definitely much lower than what you see when you walk outside and under the, in the shade and in the, the uh, direct sunlight, especially. And uh, I got to asking myself the question, okay, well, how well, what, what is sunlight? And why, why? And I was kind of surprised that there hasn't been a very good understanding of how light interacts with biological systems. And the more I dug, the more I got curious, more curious about the optics of how how light penetrates into the body, how it, you know, where it goes, and understanding even more. You have to understand that that lighting is kind of like a poorly defined term. You know, people talk about light and for most people they say what I see with my eyes. Well, that represents less than 10% of sunlight. And the body, uh, what we're learning now is the body is actually using the other 90% to do a lot of stuff. And we've created an artificial environment that is nowhere near what it used to be, what sunlight really is. And so I just kept on digging a little deeper and deeper. And I was kind of amazed that uh, there really wasn't that much in the way of real science behind the optics of the body in, in ourselves, in animals, in plants. You know, people talk a lot about it, but they, but they always use the term light. And what they really mean is visible light. And that's not the same as sunlight. And so the more I looked, the more I became intrigued with how the body has gone to great lengths to localize, collect and localize the non-visual part of sunlight in some of our most sensitive tissues like the retina, the fetus, the brain. And, uh, and from an optic standpoint, it's just really fascinating because it's a very complex thing. It's not simple like some people like to play it as. Yeah, I think electromagnetism in general is, is quite complex. And that's really where the problem lies is that people don't have the background knowledge um, to understand, I mean, frequency, wavelength, penetration, energy of photons. Like these are pretty complex terms. If you've never took physics or engineering courses, you may not know. So that's why it's so fascinating to talk to you. And you kind of made that gap um in your head you're like wow the biology is quite important so maybe we start with the photobiomodulation what do these guys have right and then maybe what do they have wrong because this is what really everybody knows about red infrared they they group red and infrared together so maybe we, we can also distinct that that red light is still part of the visible spectrum um and then once you're getting past 
what is the 700 nanometers, you're, you're getting into that near infrared um, spectrum, which is no longer visible to the human eye. But maybe for photobiomodulation, everyone knows why this is so beneficial, right? But I know you've talked, I've personally come to this conclusion as well, that it's not the end all be all, and you still can never replace sunlight, the main source of uh, near infrared and red. So maybe we talk about the good and the bad of, of photobiomodulation, because that's what people kind of know about red light today. Yeah, and and I'm not against photobiomodulation in any way, shape, or form. It's just it's a treatment. It is a a, you know, a short term blast of near infrared. And if I have one gripe about the PVM is is that we we as humans, especially Americans, tend to if a little bit's good, then let's do more. And my concern is is that I'm an old laser jock from way back when. You know, when you had near infrared lasers around, you had all kinds of lockout devices and safety devices because you can't, you don't respond. It's not like looking at headlight and you look away or looking at the sun and you look away. You don't have that, that uh, ability to, some people are putting out what I believe are somewhat harmful uh, panels where you're looking at the emitter directly and you can have some negative effects by having it be you know, too intense because in when you're dealing with uh, intensity of the peak brightness of a, of a source, the narrower I make that the bandwidth, you know, say I want to generate an optical watt of 670 nanometers. Well, an optical watt of just 670 nanometers has a very high peak. <laughs> you know, if, if you, then the more you spread it out, it's kind of like sped spread red spectrum. The more you spread out that energy over a band, the intensity levels go down. And there's some nonlinear effects and some just damage that you have to worry about if you're trying to cram everything into a narrow bandwidth emitter. Because sunlight's not narrow band. Sunlight runs from 250 nanometers beyond 3,000 nanometers. And, you know, you can get a lot of power in that but you, there's no, in nature, there's no narrow band emitters like we do with LEDs or near infrared LEDs or laser diodes. That doesn't occur in nature. It's all broadband stuff. And my concern is, is that too much narrow band emitters could be misused and be harmful. Uh, thing. The other thing is, is that to be successful, uh, a photobiomodulation company needs to show an effect within 20 or 30 minutes. You know, it's not going to be sufficient. You know, if they want to make money, they can't have somebody sitting there for, you know, hours in front of this, this uh, uh, panel um, and, and have a, a successful business, to be quite honest. And so what we've been focused on trying to do is use lighting to uh, reintroduce and provide the near infrared ratios, how much near infrared to visible ratios that you've got. And by using the entire bandwidth of the near infrared, you can do that safely without having to worry about it. I mean, for 150 years, we had incandescent light bulbs that were emitting large amounts of near infrared into our homes and offices and, you know, bed, near our bedside. And, uh, but it was broadband. It was not these narrow band emitters that everybody's using now. So. No, I think what you just said was, was important because the way I view it more as I've, as I've just gone through my own process is that it, it's our relationship with light as a whole that has become a problem. And like, that's where you brought up, I think a really important uh, point around red and infrared light, light panel devices, because we hear that X, Y, Z is good. And so we think if we push it to the nth degree, because we're so depleted of it, maybe because of an indoor lifestyle that we need to replace it with like huge amounts of red and infrared. Um, and that isn't necessarily the right approach. So like when it comes to these photobiomodulation devices, like, do you think that the main issue is the power density at such a a uh, small number of, of frequencies or how do you look at that more specifically? Well, I mean, we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand some of the, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, Glenn 
Jeffries and Bob Fosbury a little bit and some others and, and Russ Ritter. I mean, the, the, it's amazing how many different processes in the body are affected by different wavelengths. And sometimes it's not just one wavelength, but it's a combination of wavelengths. And, you know, so that you have to really take into account that, you know, if I do something at 850 nanometers, I may be affecting one biomarker. You know, I may be doing something good for one biomarker, but I may be doing something bad for another one. You know, the body's designed around the concept that there is a broadband emission that it's exposed to. It's a single sun. You know, that's one of the other problems that's going on with lighting is, is that when we're outside, we can look away or we can go in the shade or we can whatever. You know, nowadays with all the devices and with all the lights that we've got in the room, you can't look away. And, you know, you're basically constantly being alerted. And that's one of the things that I think is one of the scariest things for children in particular is that we have them in their constant state of cortisol, you know, cortisol pumps. You know, we essentially we turn the society into a bunch of cortisol addicts. You know, we're constantly being stimulated by either light or, or audio or all these different things. There's no time for the brain or whatever to rest and take a break. And uh, that's not really what we're intended to be doing. We're, we're really supposed to be, you know, having the ability to respond to danger, but then to go take a break. And, you know, I, 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 my grandpa was a dairy farmer and we put up hay and he'd have a straw hat on. He'd have a, a cotton shirt that uh, covered up his arms you know, and a pair of overalls, and he knew enough common sense to go in to the shade when it was time for a lunch break. Or even when it was getting a little bit hot, you take a little break. And uh, I, I, I'm i concerned that the constant overstimulation of our children is really responsible for a lot of the stuff that we've been, you know. When I first started this, I was just trying to make a healthier light source. But now, I mean, after doing the work we've done and looking at what we've done, I really think we're causing harm with what we're doing now. And that's where I'm really concerned. And I'm hoping that people will realize that, you know, it's not just about being healthier. It may be about not getting sick or not making people, you know, you start thinking about how many, how many studies have gone in and showed that kids learn better in natural sunlight versus artificial, how many, you know, what kind of the some of Roger's work where he's showing that, you know, people just get healthy faster when they're out in a little bit of sunlight. And it doesn't have to be super intense. It just has to be they need to do it and do it on a consistent basis. And that's one of the things I like about Glenn's work is, is that he's a, there's very few papers where they're looking at a living human doing something to it, you know, and seeing what seeing a result and a time scale that makes sense. One of the things that Glenn does is he measures at a short interval, time interval, the change in glucose levels. And, you know, he's able to show that there is this transient change associated with just giving a little bit of light uh, near infrared. And, you know, that's what nature does on a continuous basis. And that's what sunlight really is. And that's why we almost need to go in and come up with, you know, people have the thing, oh, I, I bought full spectrum bulb. No, you didn't. You didn't buy a full spectrum bulb. You bought a bulb where they added 10 nanometers of red and 10 nanometers of violet and made it a little bit broader, but that has nothing to do with daylight. That's why we call it a correlated color temperature, not a color temperature, because there is no, there, there's no similarity, similarity other than being able to, to trick your eyes. I can just as easily give a, take a blue laser, a green laser and a red laser and shine it in your eyes and you'll convince it's sunlight. And, but it's not. And so that, I guess I'd take it that as being the extreme, you know, some of these laser headlights and things of that nature, you know, you're getting everything pumped into a very narrow band of wavelengths that affect the body in a different way that are expecting to see something just 10 nanometers or 20 nanometers away, and they're not getting it. And so what's the effect of that? That's kind of what we're concerned about. 
Yeah, I think you you just touched upon so many important topics um, that I kind of want to almost summarize it quickly. So basically, Scott is saying that we cannot re- we cannot replicate the sun with these whether the therapy devices and then the harms of indoor lighting because we have these narrow band emitters. And and maybe a quick question is when you have an LED, how much of the spectrum is that really eating up? Like, is it 10 to 20 nanometers and then it's dropping significantly or is like the peak like 80 percent of that spectrum in like a 10 to 20 nanometer range and then it's kind of tailing off like a bell curve how do we conceptualize that difference because you see these light spectrum plots and sometimes they're very misleading but like when i look at like fluorescence for example they have these crazy peaks and drop-offs whereas leds are a bit they fill out the spectrum a bit more, but I almost don't believe it. Um, so I'm curious how you could best explain that to people because there seems to be a bit, like you said, of, of marketing around full spectrum when in reality um, it's it's not the case. And the sun and maybe incandescent or these other sources are, are more actually full spectrum and, and broadband emitting by, by default. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head from the standpoint of, you know, what we define as being daily, our full spectrum in the LED world right now is somewhere around 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So you got 300 nanometers of bandwidth. Within that, you'll see a blue pump, typically you'll see a blue pump or a violet pump that has a width of maybe 20 to 30 nanometers. And then there's usually a phosphor tail, cerium YAG, or something like that, that uh, gives you a broadband yellow green that covers puts out to maybe about 620, 630 nanometers. So you've got this, typically you'll have a very narrow spike and then you'll have some broadband phosphor response. And, you know, it looks like white, but it's not white. And it doesn't include any of the UV component, any of the near infrared component, any of the short wave near infrared Whereas you compare that to an incandescent, 90% of its energy is between 700 and 300, 3,000 nanometers, the deep red and the near infrared. And if you want to get visible, you have to drive it up in temperature so that you get some, some blues and some greens and some oranges and yellows. Um, but it's, again, a very much more of a broadband emission than a bunch of narrow. Fluorescence tend, our, uh, fluorescent sources are kind of an in-between. They'll have a lot of narrow band emitters, you know, maybe multiple, and then have some phosphors built in there to kind of try and smooth it out and make it look like, you know, it's all trying to trick your eye because your eye basically has three stimuli that's, that's picking up the deciding what the color is and how that, how you can do that thousands and thousands of different ways and still make the eye think that it's seeing sunlight. But, you know, our thing is more fundamental in that we're trying to say, you know, forget about the visible. I can do a lot of things. I can, you know, we use LEDs in our light sources, but we couple it with a thermal emitter that gets you from 600 out to 3000. That's what is what I think the big problem is or where the the issue is with this whole concept of full spectrum. And. And unfortunately, what makes it even worse is, is that if you want to do all the cool things where you buy a hue or some uh, some of these color changing bulbs, they're, you know, they are red, green, blue LEDs that you're then modulating at different rates to, to get all these different cool colors that everybody wants to see. It's an entertainment thing more than anything else. But not only is it narrowband, it's also pulsed at a thousand hertz. So you're getting so much of what, I, and it doesn't mean I don't believe in the EMF stuff, but so much of what we see as affected by in these studies about EMF, if you're looking in the lights are flickering at 60 hertz or 120 hertz or a thousand hertz, that can be due, that can be compounding on anything that you're getting from electromagnetic field at the, you know, on top of that. So in general, what we've created is this artificial environment that is highly pulsed, a lot of flicker, as you were saying early, and it also has a spectral 
characteristic that has nothing to do with what real sunlight is. And, you know, then you throw on top of that, that as the, the sun moves across the, it changes how it couples and what, what the spectrum is slightly as well. But uh, I would like to say one thing though, real quick. I would like to be an advocate for blue. I know I see your glasses, but, but, but uh, I think blue's gotten a bum rap because really what sunlight is, if you walk outside and you look at a blue sky, it's blue, but it also has this huge near infrared tail that goes along with it. That's nothing like the blue that you get from a display or from a, an LED light. That's a narrow band blue emitter, number one. Number two, there's no near infrared to protect you from the effects of the blue. You know, we're designed to be able to operate in a blue environment. And that the fact that we can't tells you there's something wrong with our artificial environment. So, no, that's, I mean, I can, I mean, you said a lot of good things there. I mean, it, it, it really goes back to, for me, at the end of the day, like everything you just said is like getting back to a more consistent environment that's natural for our biology. And that's difficult to do. And that's one of the gripes that I've had with. I guess, I don't know, the quantum community or whatever that's trying to find a singular solution to a multifaceted problem. Like you said earlier, light isn't this narrow band of light. I mean, it's this huge, I was looking at the, just like the, the, the narrow band of visible light compared to all the spectrum. It's just like this little teeny bit of light that we're so focused on 90% of the day. And we buy these glasses for, and we buy these red lights to try and balance it out. And like, we're, like you said, with the full spectrum bulbs, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot myself. And so you've been sort of working on a solution for this. Maybe you can talk about the approach you've taken to light, specifically indoor lighting, because it doesn't change the fact that a huge portion of our existence professionally um, and just when we get home does exist inside. And so unless you have the grace to be able to get outside like me and Tristan do like throughout the day, a lot of the time, it can be difficult and it can feel very challenging, which is where I feel people fall into the pit of buying that bulb or getting the glass or getting the red light device and stuff like that. So I'd love to hear about more of what you're working on specifically to tackle these issues. Well, I mean, you know, part of the, the thing is, is that we're, we have multiple things that are changing on us at one time. You know, when, when I was a kid, we went outside, we ran out, we, yeah, as soon as we got out of school, we were outside. And when the street lights came in, we came, we better be back in the house. You know, um, children are based on our, our modeling and the work we've been doing. Um, children are the most susceptible to the change that we've created because uh, the higher percentage of their cells are engaged with the near infrared. You know, if you look at some of Bob Fosbury's uh, pictures of near infrared of hands and things of that nature you'll see that that uh, the near infrared is penetrating inches into the body and so with children are smaller so it penetrates a higher percentage of their cells are being engaged um so from my perspective you know being my showing my age and all that you know we i may work under a fluorescent light at work but i came home to an incandescent and you know, went in read a book or read, you know, to my kids or whatever. And we spent a lot more time and none of the built, none of the windows had near infrared reflecting layers on them. Now they all do. Um, so there's been this constant change in what been happening. So it's kind of slowly creeped up on us. And because the eye has such a limited response to sunlight, it was easy enough for the industries to essentially trick everybody into thinking that it's still the same as sunlight. And to this day, I think you'll find that most people would say, well, it's a full spectrum. You know, I'm getting just like sunlight. This is great. No, you're not. You're not getting anything really close to what. And in fact, I would argue that we've gotten to the point now, understanding enough of the biology, that we can simply say that what you're doing now is harmful and needs to change now that doesn't go over well with the lighting industry too well but it does and so what we did is is that i mean it was really it's pretty simplistic 
and you can do it yourself if you want. You know, you can buy one of our light sources or you can do it yourself. Literally, uh, we combine the two and make a hybrid. We take LEDs, which are great at generating visible light, and we take short filament bulbs, and they're great at generating near-infrared. In fact, they're the world's most efficient near-infrared emitter. And you put those together in the right relationship, and I'm big on ratios, you know, because one of the things I noticed is, is that, you know, if you're sitting in direct sunlight and you look on an optical watts basis, the difference between uh, the visible to or the near infrared to visible ratio is essentially one. They're equal amounts of power in both in both parts of the spectrum. You can throw UV into that as well, but um, but then once you get into looking at the well, how we really work, I mean, we're not really designed to be sitting out in the sun, baking out on the beach all the time, you know, especially those the three of us. You know, I did a paper with Professor John Louis, and he's been trying to get the black community to understand that the displacement of them to higher latitudes has had a marked effect on their ability to generate not only vitamin D, but to actually deal with hormone levels on a widespread basis. So, I mean, so what it were really kind of designed, unless, like I say, unless you have extremely dark skin, we're really designed to be in the shade. Well, once you go into the shade, all the surrounding material, and this is some of the great pictures by Bob again, is, is that shows that all our surroundings are reflecting the near infrared component, but absorbing the visible components, how we make a tree leaf look green. It's absorbing 80% of the visible light that comes from the sun that's hitting on it. Or, and then it, but it reflects 80 to 90% of the near infrared. So it's kind of like your sunglasses in, set in kind of a reverse way. All our surroundings are the plants and are, and the elegance of the design is just amazing to me, is, is that plants and are essentially absorbing in the visible portion of the spectrum, generating through photosynthesis, creating sugars that we eat. But then the part that it doesn't need it's reflecting back into our body when we're out walking around. And that's where you get this huge enhancement of the amount of near infrared to visible ratio. So when you're sitting in the shade under, uh, under, under the tree or whatever, all the leaves, all the grass, even the dirt is strongly is, is absorbing visible, but it's reflecting near infrared and your body is sitting there absorbing this. And I, I, Wish people would, would get that the body is really a solar collector in the near infrared. That's what it's doing. You know, when we walk vertically through a forest down a park, all that reflected light is coming in from all different directions. And again, as Bob showed with some of his pictures, even if you're wearing clothes, it goes right through your clothes. So it's, uh, you're, you're essentially getting this, we're walking around in this integrating sphere where all this light's coming in from around us. Yes, you're getting some on the top of your head. It's why you should wear a hat, why you should have hair, good things that, that go along with it. Um, but, you know, but the reality is, is that the body assumes that it's got this huge amount. Of, and that's one of the beautiful things about the way the system's set up. You know, in the near infrared runs from 650 out to 3000. You can pump a ton of power into the body and still be able to tell whether that's a red apple. If I were to try, we could see out in the near infrared, we would lose all color contrast because everything would be lit up like we were covered with snow. So, but the way it's all set up and the way the system works is in that narrow band, we can discern whether that's a good snake or a bad snake. That's a red apple or an orange. All those things can happen because the fact that the eye is very selective at where it actually sees. But it gives you the body that's a huge amount of near infrared that can come into the body and essentially set a baseline of operation. And most of the people that are doing this kind of research are, are coming to the conclusion that the main function of the near infrared is to facilitate the production, uh, enhance the, the efficiency of the ETC channel and the ATP production, and also pumping up your innate immune response. 
and uh, doing other things, enhancing your ability to generate vitamin D. So there's all these different things that are now starting to fall into place where people are starting to realize that the majority of the energy going into our body, and it goes along with seasonality, it goes along with a lot of stuff that's all starting to kind of click together because we're starting to look at why would the body go to so much trouble to put the near infrared in your gray matter, in your retina, in your fetus? Why are all those things happening? Um, it's the reason because, and it's not, we're going to do something in 10 minutes. This is the body has to do this for a hundred years. You know, it's trying to get us to survive for hundreds of years, for a hundred years. And to do that, it needs to take advantage of everything that it can. And we totally underestimated how much the rest of the near, or rest of the solar spectrum means to the body. And I think that the simplest thing to say is, is that, you know, what we're doing is we're taking LEDs to generate visible. We're taking the, the short little, the little bulbs that you used to have in your flashlights when you were growing up. But you'd stick up your nose and you'd say, hey, you know, I'll tell a ghost story. But, uh, you know, bottom line is, is that uh, we just put the two of them together in the right ratios. And I do believe very strongly that the ratios are important and that you should have a single source doing the ratio. You can do it. You can take an incandescent bulb if you can find one, put it on your desk with a little lamp and have your, t your uh, laptop sitting there and let it reflect off. And you'll get an effect, but we're just trying to say, hey, you know, we want to control the ratios and control the intensity levels to where we know that it's safe and we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I think a couple points in there that are, were eye opening for me and whoever's read your work and have learned about these things about near infrared light is that the reflection off of plant matter and the environment we're in is even skewing the ratio higher. Cause what is it? It's like 50, 55% from the sun is uh, in that infrared spectrum. But then now if we're getting the reflectivity and the absorption of visible, I think you say it's probably closer to three to one, correct? Yeah, yeah. And and it, 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 is, it is a remarkable, and one of the things that Bob and I have been looking at here lately is the ubiquitous nature of the red edge. You know, if you start looking at all the different spectra of reflectance characteristics, transmission characteristics. There's always this major shift right around that 650 to 700 nanometer range where reflectivity goes from, you know, in plants, it goes from 20% up to 80%. In transmission in the body, you see this huge change where once you get past that 650 nanometer range, all of a sudden, every, the absorption constants drop like crazy, scatter levels drop, and you get this deep penetration into the body. So there's, there's something fundamental about the red edge. It's not just because of plants or for plants. It's also for the human body as well because it kind of it, it lets you have, okay, I can see all this stuff and do what I need to do to eat and get what I want and survive. But then I can also pump in a bunch of energy to help me sleep better. You know, one of the things that uh, the other thing that, that I think is that we're trying to figure out and understand better is this whole circadian thing. It's like we've got about half the equation done, you know, because uh, what we're, you know, everybody has cortisol high in the morning, melatonin low in the morning, melatonin high in the evening, cortisol low in the evening. You know, that's the mantra for circadian. And yet what we're finding now is I can generate huge amounts of melatonin in the body simply by going out and exercising at 9 a.m. in the morning. And the only reason we haven't seen it before is you actually, it's transient. So you have to actually measure it with a frequency of, of testing that you can see. And there's only about five papers, Glenn being one of them where they measure with a high enough sampling frequency to where you can see the transient change. And so built on top of all this circadian stuff is this, uh, this ability of the body to generate all these different hormones. And it's not just melatonin. Cortisol goes up rapidly when we exercise. You know, 
dopamine, oxytocin. There's all these different effects that are going on. And it's really, I believe, it's really why when you go and do something like heavy exercise or you go out and you get in the sunlight, you're at the beach, people say, why am I so tired? Well, if you look at it on a transient basis, melatonin is actually being pumped up. It pumped up when you're doing the stressor, but it takes it a while to go back down. And so that's what gives you that little extra, ah, I kind of, you know, and it's a, you think about it from the elegance of the, the design, it's essentially giving us a little bit of a, okay, time to cool down, settle down. You take, you get the same effect with a cold shower. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can be affecting the melatonin and cortisol levels in the body. And so, you know, I, I just think that uh, how we measure stuff has been a, the problem. You know, most of the circadian work has been done, put somebody down on a bench, tell them to be quiet, don't leave, feed them anything, don't do anything. Uh, and then we'll, we can see these hormone changes. But the minute you do something that you actually have, you live and to have an event, then all those hormone levels are shifting rapidly. And we're not taking those into account. And it's causing a lot of uh, mis, you know, I'd say misunderstanding as to what's really going on. So. Yeah. And I kind of want to, this is a good transition talking more about the deeper biological effects, but to summarize kind of a lot of your earlier points, you know, we have this artificial light environment that's very deficient in near infrared and we, you know, it's an epidemic and you, you brought up the children. This is extremely important. Blue light is not inherently bad. It's only bad in the wrong context, the narrow band emitters. Um, so now we understand that getting outside is extremely important. And especially in nature, in the shade, we're getting a tremendous amount of near infrared light that has all these potent biological effects like the melatonin you're talking about right now. And I think that's an important takeaway for people because they're trying to understand how they can better improve their health. And this is something that's like readily accessible is, is changing your lighting environment, trying to go outside um, as much as you can. But I kind of wanted to, you mentioned the glass piece. So if anyone didn't catch that, like glass um, now, and that's your windows, your, your car windshield has a, a coating. And so it's low emissivity. So it's blocking that. It's all a result of, energy efficiency standards, um, which actually in the winter time is you want to have more infrared. I mean, you want to have more infrared all the time, but in the winter, especially it can help um, from a heating perspective. But now we talk about kind of the important biological effects and the circadian component. So you're saying that near infrared and your work with Russell has been, I think this is just a landmark discovery and understanding because to me, melatonin is one of the most important compounds in our body. Our mitochondria, um, probably the most important area of our biology. And we're now understanding from your guys' work, and you can elaborate further, that that near-infrared light is, is stimulating this melatonin synthesis in the day in our mitochondria. And that is then helping maintain that redox homeostasis, correct? Yeah, and, and you have to divide it into two things. There is no doubt there's a circadian effect. There's no doubt at all. Mm -hmm. I'm not arguing that. The problem is, is that there is the rest of the world, our life. Anything we do changes those hormone levels significantly and actually contribute to uh, your ability to sleep in a lot of ways. I mean, if you looked at it, when we first started out, everything was blue was bad. If you get rid of blue, we're good. Then it was, well, now we got to, well, you need to, to get uh, get uh, the uh, a little bit of blue in the morning to get you going, and then you need to cut it down. And now we're at the point where we're not really sure. I mean, a lot of the circadian leaders are kind of scratching their head, to be quite honest right now, because they haven't gotten the results that they thought they would get. And you know, now what we're showing is, is that on top of this whole circadian thing, is the rest of your life. I mean, if you go out and you do exercise, you go outside, you get sunlight, you go take a cold shower, you have great sex, 
you know, all those things are causing huge shifts in hormones that um, aren't taken into account, but they sum up in the course of 12 hours to a significant portion, if not the majority of the hormone characteristics within the body. And so, you know, that's where I think they're, they're not, when Theron did, this, did his, some of his research, what he was doing is he, was, he took it at nine o'clock in the morning, he took a bunch of people, put them on treadmills or on stair steppers, and he monitored their melatonin levels at nine o'clock in the morning throughout the exercise period, which was four hours long. And what you saw was is that the melatonin levels peaked up rapidly to levels that are much higher than what we see at nighttime in, in, from the pineal gland. And it's plateaued and it stayed there for during the course of the, the exercise. And then it dropped down to back to baseline after about an hour. Now, Gao also did his experience, experiments under exercise where he measured the cortisol levels in mel uh, during the exercise event on a time scale of 10 minutes or more or less. And what he saw was is that when you start exercising, cortisol goes up very rapidly to a very high level. But then uniquely, what he also showed was is as you get into the exercise, the cortisol levels start to drop, which makes sense. Cortisol is very important. You need it to respond to danger and all that kind of stuff, but you can't have it being running high all the time. So what it appears now is that the melatonin that's being generated during exercise or being outside in the sun or all these other things is actually starting to affect the ACTH levels, which then causes the cortisol to fall off. So you get a spike in melatonin, a spike in cortisol during exercise. Eventually the body naturally tries to finish with an excess of melatonin, which is, I believe is what you feel that, that sensation that you get after exercise or being at the beach all day you just feel kind of tired for a little bit. Well, that's that melatonin, the non-pineal non melatonin levels dropping off. And the exercise is the easiest one to do because there's so many mitochondria in the muscles and that they're so intimately connected to the blood plasma that you can actually see the effect very, quite readily. You know, And then you can also see it in sweat. Uh, Zhu did a a series of papers where she showed that the sweat, you know, melatonin goes up during exercise, cortisol goes up during exercise. So built on all these understandings of circadian, that being this nice, well-controlled thing is all this other stuff going on. And uh, that's what actually I think is probably the most important thing for people to realize is, is that they can, their actions during the day have a significant impact on their ability to sleep at night you know, independent of circadian, you know, so that, that's what I guess I'd say is the, uh, one of the, the unique characteristics that we were able to see. Because, you know, like I say, I mean, I don't believe that any of the circadian, I mean, well, I should just say, Lockley made some comments early on where he's talking about alerting factors, where he could see changes in melatonin and cortisol. But the real problem is, is you have to actually measure a very specific way in a, at a rapid enough rate in order to see these transient effects. But they're real and probably more significant than in a lot of the circadian effects. Yeah, I think it's, um, it all comes back to sunlight, right? Like in nature and not trying to overcomplicate things and, and understanding that whatever we have in our natural environment is, is really providing the right input signal to us. And there's a, some other cool sources of near infrared light that I, you know, want to kind of get into and, or, and then maybe we can talk about the biological effects at a mitochondrial level, um, water. We recently had Gerald Pollock on the show. But something that, you know, you mentioned that's very important, right, is, is seasonality. You also mentioned some important things about how we get a ton of our energy, perhaps a majority of our energy from sunlight, which is predominantly near infrared. So in the wintertime, right, uh, we have saunas that have become popular in Scandinavian countries, um, and we have the ability to get cold or, or we get 
cold in the winter time when there's less sun. And this past winter, I embraced seasonality to a higher degree than ever before. And I really think I uncoupled my mitochondria to a higher level than I ever have. So how do you think of the infrared component from both heat sources like a sauna or a hot tub or hot springs that have been used as like ways to combat, you know, less energy from the sun in the winter. And then also cold stimulating uncoupling, potentially stim stimulating internal infrared slash heat production. Is this a valid way to think about how we can kind of compensate uh, in a period with, with lower light energy? Well, I don't discount anything yet right anymore i've i mean i've been amazed at some of the <laughs> the stuff that uh, you know when you're looking at it and you're seeing that the body is actually designed optically to do certain things to localize the way it is you know we can't even come close to do we can do maybe some of the, the structural elements you know as if you look at like the mitochondria and you look at the, all the structure within there and then you could say okay it's not only the structure but it's also the biochemistry that's going on at the same time, we can't even come close to matching what the body's been doing for millions of years. So, you know, I think we got a long way to go to, to judge anybody's technology one way or the other. But, uh, you know, I would, I would make a point that, you know, what you generate thermally uh, at levels of the body temperature, even above that slightly, you know, there's a big gap as far as the wavelength distribution of those black bodies, you know, they, they, they don't really mesh up. You know, what we're talking about is something that's closer to visible light. If you're talking about something going on inside the body at 98.6 or you know, whatever, 100 degrees, you know, that's that there's basically no photons. That, there's a gap there. So I, I would say that they're, they're probably two unique, very unique situations. I don't discount them at all as being important. I mean, one of the things with Gerald Pollack, I, I felt sorry for him for all those years that he was essentially vilified when he was going on about the easy water. Uh, but now everybody's, what he just needed to do was rename it because now it's bound water or some of crystalline or something else. And everybody's now, oh yeah, that's something good. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the guy was right. I mean, there's effects that are going on at all different wavelengths and, in ways that we don't understand. I mean, as far as saunas, uh, I think they're great. And I see it as kind of like the same thing of, uh, to do with uh, eating a lot of fish at your northern, northern latitudes. You know, you're essentially compensating for the fact you don't have sunlight available during those dark periods. Jumping into an ice bath, as I said, one of the cool experiments that Gao did is he literally took uh, put a cortisol sweat sensor on his left arm and on the right arm, they put it in an ice bath. Eight minutes later, you could see the cortisol signature in the arm that wasn't in the ice bath, you know? So, I mean, there's all kinds of things going on that uh, we shouldn't, that are additive, you know? Going and jumping into getting a cold shower is going to pump up your melatonin and your cortisol levels. It's going to, you know? And done at the right time, that can be very beneficial, to how you sleep, to your anxiety levels. You know, what? how many people go get in a sauna and jump in the cold water just to kind of chill out a little bit, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, getting a little relaxation, it drops the anxiety levels. So, you know, I, I, I don't discount any of those things. I'm just saying that for us, we're just trying to take away what we, something that we think is a really negative for everybody. And that's really kind of where we've gotten to on this whole discussion about why we're doing what we're doing. It used to be I was trying to make something healthy. Now I'm just trying to prevent us from being exposed to something that is not healthy. And that's, uh, I think, a big difference. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a lot of the difference in general with modern living uh, and sort of like talking about a lot of people talk about ancestral principles and that's sort of in some sense what we're talking about to a degree, but it's sort of like you said, it's like mitigating the damage. And that's something that I think about a lot, especially for people that live in cities. And there's a lot of problems within that as well, just with outdoor light pollution alone, especially at inadvertent at times, if we're going to be talking about 
circadian balance, but I'd love to talk about a little bit um, about the difference between the melatonin made in the pineal gland versus the, the mitochondria just briefly again um, to get into, because we, we talked about like you, you make, we talked to uh, Deanna Minnick about melatonin, uh, man, a month or two ago. And we were talking there about making melatonin in the gut mucosa as well. And so, like you said, in a sense, everything affects everything. And that's why I found like those exercise studies super interesting because it's like, it kind of spits in the face of what we all thought is this sort of unique system that's very kind of beautiful and has a nice graph of cortisol coming up and coming down and melatonin coming up and coming down. And so in a way, I kind of like that it's that way because in my mind, it, it makes it simpler in, in my mind, but I'd love to talk about uh, from an energy perspective, uh, why that's important. Well, I mean, melatonin was selected by the pineal gland in the body to protect the brain during times of low cellular activity because it is the best antioxidant we have. It's not only an antioxidant, but all its metal metabolites are antioxidants as well. So it, there's, you get a cascading effect. So I would argue that absolutely, we want to know when to turn on the pineal gland to protect the brain be, during periods of low cellular activity. If, if I'm correct, and the data shows that, that that's what's going on, during the day, all your cells, all the mitochondria at some level are generating some level of melatonin and protecting their self and increasing, essentially, you know, providing you with local protection uh, during the day. Now, when we go to sleep or want to have low cellular activity, that uh, ability drops off. And I believe that what, it, the, the, what circadian really is meant to do is to provide supplemental melatonin to the brain so it can continue to operate at 80% of its efficiency that it does during the day. And trying to tie that into sleep is kind of like, I think we've got it a little bit backwards. You know, I think that there's a keys, the body is providing keys to the pineal gland as to when it should do what, it, what it's going to do. And it's a very important function, don't get me wrong, but trying to argue that that's the sole source of melatonin as what most of the, the biology books will tell you is just wrong. I mean, if, it, if it's not wrong, tell me how I can generate 200 picograms per milliliter at 9 a.m. in the morning, you know, where's it coming from? You know, and you know, where's the, all the stuff that's coming out of our gut? Things of that nature. There's tons and tons of melatonin being generated. The problem is, or not the problem, but the point is it's being generated at a local level by the mitochondria to deal with the high levels of reactive oxygen species that are being brought on it by exposure to sunlight, exposure to uh, exercise, things of that nature. You know, you think about it from just the, the, the practical standpoint, there is no way that I have my right arm and I'm pumping iron, you're sitting here and that particular arm is generating all kinds of reactive oxygen species that any signal can go to any gland in the body and come back and say, you know, provide this, this, this muscle, you know, there's not a systemic response. There has to be a local response. And the way the cells are set up, they are capable. And that's what I think it, we, we proved in our paper that was published in Melaton Research is, is that when you're doing things that are generating high levels of reactive oxygen species on a local level in a muscle, that muscle has to protect itself. It can't wait on something for the body to do in order to kick up some gland somewhere to generate it. It's got to it's got to be able to do it locally because of the time constants that are involved. I mean, if you go, that's one of the things. If you look at how sunlight, the number of photons that are hitting on a cell in a second, it's huge. And even if a very small percentage of them are generating a reactive oxygen species, or they're generating, you know, uh, causing some other biological effect, the the cell cannot depend on the body to just it has to do something. And so what's clear is, is that it is generating an antioxidant. It's not, and 
Melatonin upregulates glutathione. It changes, you know, that type of stuff. So, and in, in some ways, it's kind of like when you look at it from sunlight's perspective, most of uh, treatments and medicines are from the inside out. But we're going from the outside in. And you look at how, you know, the first 100 or 200 microns of uh, the outer skin essentially don't even have blood vessels in them. <laughs> They're depending on their ability to. And so you look at all the different things that a skin cell can do. It has the ability to generate almost every hormone in the body de novo because it can't depend on somebody to the, the other glands to kick up and provide a systemic response. You know, why do you get a sunburn in one part and the strap is, doesn't have a burn, you know? It's not responding on a systemic level. It's responding locally. And I think that's probably one of the key things that we're trying to show is, is that there are all these other sources of melatonin and cortisol that are being generated in a non-systemic but local response. Does that answer it's your really question? It's really incredible, Rob. Yeah, I think it's just so incredible and understanding the massive importance of melatonin and how it has that cascading effect as an antioxidant. But it's really this battle ongoing of, of redox homeostasis continually in the mitochondria and that it really should be a focus of, of more research, right? Like if, if this is such an imperative area, why are we not spending as uh, you know nearly any research dollars on it compared to other areas? And the solution seems simple. So maybe we kind of talk a little bit about that, right? The solution is, you know, getting more light exposure, getting outdoors more. But we have this challenge now in our indoor lit world. So basically what you're working on and what your premise is, is that if we go back to kind of a more healthy lighting style indoors, do you think that is still that's good enough? Or do you think we're leaving a ton of photon density, a ton of photon energy still on the table by just not spending enough time outside? And, and how do we really fix that if this is, you know, the majority of our energy source, or at least, you know, depending on the time of year and location that you're at, a, and obviously a different source of energy compared to electrons and, and protons, let's say from food, how do we think about our future going forward because it seems like we're trending in the opposite direction and people can't go outside maybe all day long um, as much as I would like to. You know, what are some simple things and, and really what would you like to see longer term? Do you think this gets solved from technology or lifestyle? Unfortunately, I think it's going to take both. I mean, I, I don't see how you can, you know, we don't claim to solve all problems. We're just trying to prevent being exposed to something that we think is harmful. And, you know, that's what we're, our focus is on. Uh, we generate five optical watts of near infrared out of each bulb. You know, if you put that on, on a desk lamp or something near you, that kind of simulates the, the level of near infrared that you would get sitting underneath a, on a cloudy day under a tree. You know, I don't claim that that's enough. I would say that, you know, we have to, we, we unfortunately got into a mode of the sun is bad and, you know, everything, you know, it creates, it's created more problems than it's created, than it's taken care of, in my opinion. So I think it's up to a lot of parents to, to start saying, you know, no, you can't sit there at the Game Boy. You need to go outside, you know, go outside with your Game Boy. I don't care. Just go outside, you know, and and uh, that kind of a change. Go ahead. You were going to say something? No, oh, I'm sorry. But, no, you're um, good. You're good. No, I, I mean, I think that if nothing else, I'm hoping that what we can do with the – by getting people to realize that the near-infrared is, is an active part in our health. Because, I, you know, when I did a, some of the work on seasonality I did, you know, it's pretty clear that sunlight plays a major role in our ability to fight off pathogens. You know, people have this perspective that, 
um, you know, that the body's just all of a sudden a virus comes in and that's it. The reality is, is that we're constantly being attacked by all kinds of stuff. And the skin in particular is a major battlefield. And one of the things that I'd like to see more research into is it appears based on some of the work by uh, Hudson and others that the body actually generates a high level of hydrogen peroxide in the interstitial fluid on the outside of the skin as part of a protective part of our protection. It actually makes it difficult for a bacteria or virus to enter into the skin. And what she did is she basically just exposed skin cells to near infrared and far infrared and saw a 6x increase in the amount of hydrogen peroxide that's being generated. Well, the cute thing about that or the cool thing about that is, is that the it turns out that our production of vitamin D is it's very it's 285 nanometer UVB. That's what actually does it. But it the skin appears and it doesn't matter whether white, black or uh, any other color race. There's an outer 50 microns of the skin that is photochemically bleached to enhance the ability of the body to convert cholesterol into the precursors for vitamin D. So I think that what, if I just broadly would say, the reason we picked what we did for our delight design is, is that something in this short wave IR sitting at 2000 nanometers could be to helping the UV more effectively do generate vitamin D and so that there's no one wavelength that uh, is just, you know, perfect. It's, it, there is, uh, it's all working together in this amazing symphony that, you know, if you got one that's out of tune, it sounds pretty bad. If it's all everybody's in tune, then it goes pretty good. So I, you know, I believe very strongly there's studies that show that, uh, you know, that not only do you have this hydrogen peroxide, uh, barrier that we're putting up. We also, uh, the near infrared enhances T cell velocity. You know, there's a number of different uh, innate immune responses. So, I mean, I think that we couldn't have picked the worst thing to do during COVID than to put people inside. You know, 99.9% .9 of all infections occurred indoors, you know, and I believe because when the body is outdoors, it has a higher propensity to be able to combat and prevent the spread of disease. And that was our big takeaway from our look at seasonality is, is that, you know, that's what, it's not just that we all get inside around each other. It's the fact that we're more likely to transmit the disease, you know, because our body is more likely to spit it out and we're more likely to receive it and take it in. And that's where I think that we need to get people to understand the importance of getting out in the sun on a regular basis because it's also bolstering their immune response. No, I mean, it's really interesting because the more I've sort of come to similar conclusions about things, it's that nothing's black and white as we've sort of been talking about this whole conversation everything sort of working together in symphony like you just said i think that's a beautiful analogy um with light is that when you isolate something it becomes unnatural and so the idea is to be as, as close to nature as you can um so what do you think about like in, uh, putting uv in, in bulbs as well um well the whole that. goal our eventual goal is to get the uv portion in leds can generate pretty UV pretty well. But I don't believe they should go into bulbs until we have the near infrared component in there to protect Definitely. them. Yeah. And so the, the first step was to do near infrared because you talk to anybody about UV, they immediately go ballistic on you. And, uh, you know, but once I think the people understand that, okay, we put everything both back in except the UV, and now we can put the UV in because you just lived for, you know, your grandfather lived for 80 years under UV and did just fine and, you know, kept his wits about him. You know, you know, most of the stuff we've been talking about have has to do with the physiological, 
my concern is is that you know if you look at the model of the brain and how light propagates down into the fissures of the brain and the gray matter's position on the brain you really get to the point you come to the conclusion that there's a neurological effect in this whole thing as well and a lot of the anxiety a lot of the issues with adhd you know they're all kind of running in the same veins and i hope that what we could do is really substitute i'm not saying that medicine is bad i'm just saying cut it down a little bit by getting some of this other component into the into the mix getting outside playing outside you know i think that there's a lot to be said for that now of course i will immediately say go ahead and put a hat on i will also immediately say i think the skin uh, skin block is our uh, sunblock is it's terrible you know for most people especially for people who have dark skin color you know the fact that they're putting spf in makeup for women that have dark skin that's just wrong i mean it doesn't make any sense they have almost zero chance of getting melanoma and on top of which they're already struggling especially at higher latitudes to generate enough vitamin d to be healthy and so the fact we just generically put it in all makeup is just not a good idea in my opinion it, yeah, I mean, that's the context that people need to think about and also the nuance of applying it to themselves, their heritage, um, you know, their location, right? Their zip code. So I, I've mentioned that a few times and it's it's kind of unsettling to some people, but it's just a logical conclusion. It's like, what is the environment you were designed for, you know, over millennia and think of how you need to embrace your local environment with respect to that. And you bring up some good points about the ability to wear clothing. That was an eye opener for me, especially in the winter time. People are like just spending so much more time indoors because it's just cold. But as you mentioned, the infrared light is, is penetrating, you know, layers. Like I, th I think I looked at the one study and it was like even if you're wearing nine layers, you know, 40, 50 percent is still getting through. So, you yeah. know, any there's there's a benefit to getting outside in, in any capacity. Um, and that's awesome that you think we do need to have, especially UVA, which is so prevalent and so important for our biology. The way I think about it, um, I guess we come back to this scenario, right? Like, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to emulate sunlight as best as we possibly can. So for that regard, like you want to add maybe UV, you want to add, you know, you have the near infrared good ratio with the visible is there like a timing component to this? Because I, I think back to the circadian stuff and, and what really matters maybe, and that's like, you know, UVA rise, UVB rise, you know, the angle of incidence for lighting being pretty important. Um, and as someone who's cognizant of EMFs, I'm like, well, I don't want to add, you know, more PCBs to, to, a, to a product <laughs> to control the timing of it. But there, there might be some customizable solution there to where it's like different time of day is is able to be you know um exposed to a different time or a different frequency spectrum of, of light potentially so ha, i'm sure you've thought about that i'm curious your take on if that's well, the, feasible the, in yeah. a light fixture well we have we have two bulbs one bulb is a dc bulb where as a function of voltage it goes from the imagine you have an led generating visible light and you've got this filament that's generating a little bit of visible but a lot of near infrared Okay, when the bulb is at full brightness, it has an equal ratio similar to what, or a three to one, similar to what you have in, in shade conditions. And then as you drop the voltage, the LEDs go down faster than the incandescent, and eventually you just have incandescent at the end when you have this nice orange glow. So it essentially mimics a change from higher color temperature down into lower color. And a lot of people look at it and say they can't tell the difference between our bulb and an incandescent because one of the things that people don't realize is is that when we went over to leds we gave up a huge amount of dimming range that we used to have in incandescence you used to be used to walk in and you could dim it down to this nice romantic warm glow that doesn't happen in leds anymore they go kind of blue or they only dim by 10 percent or one percent so they don't have the dimming characteristics, the timing, as you say, 
associated with what's more natural. So that's the way our, our lights are set up, both for our DC and our AC. Our AC still has a little bit of flicker in it because it's a, an AC input, but we've cut it down to the lowest level we could, but it does exactly the same thing. As you start to dim, it, uh, the ratio of infra near infrared or incandescent to LED changes and it literally looks like if you were to put an incandescent bulb in a standard Lutron dimmer, you can dim it down and the two look identical to what we do to the point that you can get down to this just not. We have about 100,000 to one dimming range on our bulbs because exactly what you're saying, the timing does matter. There are times where you just want to have your child have just a little bit of a nightlight, an orange glow nightlight. And there's times where you want to be nice and bright and, and awake, you know. And so we provide them with that via dimming. Um, that way we don't have is to. Is that do dimming? It. Yeah, but, I was just going to. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask, is that dimming all pulse control or have you done gone to back to D.C. as well for that? We have both. Our desk okay. lamp is a DC version. We actually offer in the DC, we offer two versions. We have a, a cute little thing where you can re just reverse polarity of the bulb. And what happens is it goes from LED plus incandescent to incandescent only. And so it gives you that kind of like nightlight type thing. But it, we also have a DC to DC converter arrangement that we've developed where we can actually do it all DC. I agree with you totally. I would prefer that all of us get switched over to DC, but it's the reality is, is that there's an awful lot of people that could benefit from an AC solution. So we provide both. Um, we've tried to drop the, any of the flicker down to levels that are reasonable. You know, bear in mind that in an AC socket, uh, an incandescent bulb has 15% modulation and even it's, so it's not perfect either. Um, that's why I prefer the DC solution myself. So I make a, I may, we make a bulb that way and then provide a driver system so that you can just have DC, uh, for, for that. So, you know, so I agree with you totally on the, 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 the timing and, and issues. It all matters. What I found really fascinating was, is that, that you have to look at, uh, like this solution from a timing standpoint when you're talking about different time constants, you know, circadian deals with a day time, 12 hour time constant. But if you look at uh, what we're showing with the hormone responses, their time constants are on or 10 minutes. And then if you look on the cellular level and you do that with some great work by Peter Light up in Canada, you could see that the cell wall potential is responding in milliseconds. So, the idea that we can sit there and flash a bunch of lights around that we can't see with our eye but are not affecting our cells is just wrong. You know, it has an effect, and some people would characterize that as EMF. Some people would characterize it as a photopic response. But they're probably both going on, to be honest. So, so you mentioned, well, that, that's very true. And, and again, I, I can't wait to build my own house and have a DC, you know, system because. Put in uh, 48 volts. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm going to be calling all my friends that th there's only a couple engineers who understand biology. So I, I know who I'm going to be calling during that. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I used to work in DC, DC conversion um, for semiconductors. And, you know, I never realized how, you know, relevant and that would be to understanding topics like this but going to that you know the emf discussion is an interesting one and, and you kind of commented on it earlier and you, you bring up a point that i think robert obecker kind of pointed to as well he's like saying that a lot of radio frequency is really they're harmful because because they're pulsing in that in that low frequency range and you could say the same thing uh, about artificial light or, or that's basically what you said and and really that's where our biology is operating at. So I'm curious how you think about the electromagnetic spectrum as a whole and you know how we address that aspect and, and how electromagnetic interference may be taking place in our biology because there's well, certainly a lot of, lot of people thinking about that. Well, I, I think back, I used to design avionics for uh, 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 
or night vision av avionics and all that. And I, one of the things I had to do is I had to, to build a EML, an EMI room for testing for EMP of all things. And, uh, you know, it, the problem was is that we had to make sure everything was really clammed up real well because, you know, the guy next to in the uh, one of the other offices was uh, our labs had a pacemaker. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, you can get into real extreme issues with EMF. And uh, I don't underestimate the power. We used to have a warm coffee in this crazy thing that we built. But, uh, but you know, in general, I guess I'd say that, that um, we are, you are causing stimulation of the cells at a kilohertz to megahertz range given light modulation on existing light sources. You know, you are not only doing the low wave, the low frequency uh, microwave and megahertz and things of that nature that we think of in, in telecommunications and radio, but you're also modulating using light in the frequency range of kilohertz and megahertz as well. I mean, that was one of the things that, like I say, Peter Light, what he did is he literally put electrodes on a single cell and was able to measure the voltage variation as a function of pulse light. And he, he showed that, you know, your cells are responding and with kilohertz response rates. And so while it may not be your technical definition of EMF, you, you essentially are generating a similar effect by all these different, you know, you look at a lot of the color changing bulbs. They're all being modulated at a thousand hertz. You look at some of the fluorescent guys, they did 10,000 hertz, you know, and they did that because they couldn't get that. That was a level where they weren't seeing significant effects. But I know people that respond very negatively to fluorescent lighting, you know, and 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 it's not just a in their head thing. They physically have changes in their physiology. And so I think that, you know, when you talk about EMF, you need to add in the fact that we are modulating light at a frequencies that very much would mimic an EMF effect. So. Yeah, I mean, it's all EMF, right? Yeah. It's all EMR. Yeah. It's all yeah. photons I mean, and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, people tend to, uh, I think when people, you talk about EMF, they talk, they think more about what's going on in, in the megahertz and kilohertz cell phones. Range. Yeah. yeah, and cell phones. But I um, mean, it's just extraordinary. Yeah, because to me, then it's like, we're getting attacked from all angles, really. We have, you know, pulse modulation control of our cell phones, our communication, of our lighting. Um, we have 60 hertz or 50 hertz in our electrical systems that's you know all around us all the time so it's like we have this emi we have this effect 24 7 365 and it's it's really to me causing issues that we don't understand deeply at all because we're ignorant to accept the fact that that's the reality of the situation so mm -hmm. if you are standing up there scott how, how do you convince people that, that we're inherently electromagnetic beings and that we need to be prioritizing these issues to a greater degree i have no earthly idea <laughs> <laughs> you know it it's it you know it's 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 hard because it is complicated it's not straightforward and and people have lives they're living and they're trying to figure out stuff and you know it's hard to to keep from getting into the glazed approach you know glazed eye response you know, that you get from a lot of people. I mean, I, I think the problem it really is, is that the eye is such a lousy or great. In some ways, it's great. In some ways, it's really lousy because it only lets you look at a very small portion of what's going on. And especially when you start talking about pulse width modulation and all the other stuff that we're doing that are kind of people are don't have any clue what's going on with it, you know. It, 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 the people, like I say, their eyes kind of glaze over and they say, well, you know, I'm not dead yet, you know, type thing. But 
you know, I look at it that PBM, you know, even the, the sauna craze and all this other stuff, it's all pointing to the same fact. There's something anemic in our environment that we've created and it needs to be corrected if we don't expect to have long-term consequences. And that's why I've focused so much on children. That beside, on top of which, you know, I have vested in personal interest in getting something going with children's stuff. But, uh, you know, it, it, we have no right, I don't believe, to ignore this. I mean, we've got enough data out there that showing the effect of all this modulation. You know, you think about it, I did a graph a while back and really when we were in the old days, you know, the maximum frequency response that you saw out of anything around you was about a hertz. And that was uh, something that, and you use that, you know, to respond as a danger signal. You know, the tiger was coming, the, the, the boulder is rolling down the hill at you, but the majority of the time it was very low frequency modulation that we were exposed to and anything that was high frequency was an alerting effect. That's why we had cortisol do, we have adrenaline that pumps. We have all these things that were trying to keep us alive when that thing was trying to eat us, you know, but now we're just constantly exposing everybody to a low level of high frequency modulation that never occurs. I mean, people can get that, hey, if I sew at 15 Hertz, some people have an epileptic response. Well, you're, you're pumping them not at 15 hertz, you're doing it 60 and 120 and 240 and 1,000 and 10,000 that doesn't occur in nature. And now we're kind of surprised all of a sudden that there's some kind of a neurological effect or anxiety level. You know, I, some of the people that I've talked to and we've given some of our light sources to, you know, they literally are almost trapped in their home, in their home by some of these effects. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to fix it, but all I know is, is that this is going on and it shouldn't be going on if you believe that nature's a certain way it should be. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true and I, I couldn't agree with you more. And what you're working on is so important for this exact reason um, because people do need alternatives. Be, you know, if there's no better alternative out there, they're just going to be living with the same issues in this toxic soup and you know that's also why daylight computer is really important and and we talked about that but if we don't have a better alternative for people they're going to be stuck and then the second thing that comes in is the the research and that's why you know what you've done with with russell and and, and glenn studying you know blood glucose going down 30 percent from red light exposure it's incredible but i i get concerned because this type of research is, is almost hard to come by because of the incentives and the funding sources. So, you know, maybe the last question here is how is it for you guys kind of getting funding and being pioneers in a scientific community <laughs> that has kind of gone backwards from really trying to be on the cutting edge of, of topics, I would say. Well, uh, one, I was once told that you start out with uh, they ignore you then they attack you and then it's their idea. I think we're somewhere between attack and, you know, ignore, ignoring and attacking at this point. But, uh, you know, it's hard because, uh, you know, we've been lucky, we're friends and family, you know. We got friends, family, and pastor. That's who's, who's our funding sources at this point, you know. Um, so, uh, and that's literally true. Um, but- uh, Incredible. Yeah, because I mean, I think that there is a large body of people like yourself who are questioning what we've done. And, you know, we're starting to sell lamps. I don't claim that they're going to solve all your problem, but I hope it raises their awareness and makes them think about, well, maybe I should go and take 15 minutes outside, you know, because it's important enough for me to buy this stupid lamp. I should at least go and try and, you know, live by what I think. Um, I think it's especially true, you know, when you look at it optically, we've got to have the very hard, we got to put on our big boy pants and have a hard conversation 
you know, that certain people need certain things. I, I'm continually amazed how women in particular are much more sensitive to this than men are. You know, we need to learn to shut up and sit down and listen because the reality is they're much more in tune to color than we are. They're much more um, sensitive to a lot of the problems, you know, that we think, you know, oh, it's just hormones or something. But they're also, there's this huge problem in that, you know, most of the research is done with a male bias. And it's, it really needs to start shifting towards understanding how females have a different deal, things that they're having to deal with. You know, my wife can put up 15 shades of blue. I see two. She sees 15. You know, uh, no, it's a, it's a given fact. And, uh, you know, that's so you shouldn't argue about paint with your wife or friend or whatever. Um, so, you know, but um, I don't know. I To me, uh, I think that that the VCs um, are probably not going to be the route. I'm not even sure that the lighting industry is the route. What we're finding is, is that the medical community and the architects are really the two groups that are starting to figure out that, hey, you know, from the medical, you know, I know you've probably seen some of Roger's videos and some of the stuff he's done where he's taking people out, Roger Seaholt, and mm -hmm. taking people outside and seeing remarkable effects in, in their, not only in their physiological health, but in their neurological health. You know, I think once they start figuring out that there's a dollar figure that's associated with getting people out of a hospital faster or the outcome being more positive, then, you know, I think there'll be a shift towards, hey, maybe we should, you know, when the guy walks into or the gal walks into the hospital for a surgery, maybe they should go into a solarium area where there's not a near infrared blocking window and the lighting is all, you know, DC with a, a little bit of, you know, UV and near infrared thrown in just for the heck of it. See if we can get their cortisol levels down. Because chronic cortisol, you know, you're always pumped up when you're going into a hospital anyway. If you can drop that cortisol level a little bit, that just inherently kicks up your immune system, your innate immune system response. So, I mean, there are reasons to think that they're going to be the ones that drive it. And then I think the architects are looking for they all like daylight. It's another term like light that is totally misused. You know, one of my pet peeves is, is that we talk about all this biophilic stuff where you put a wall of plants inside a building, but it, the, the light coming in from the window is all blocking all the near infrared. So any of the benefits associated with the biophilics is kind of like out the door. And, uh, you know, so... I think that uh, architects are very practical and very, uh, they're starting to get into this daylighting a little bit. And I'm just hoping that uh, they'll drive it a little bit more too. Because if the architects start specifying it, then the lighting industry doesn't get a choice. I love it. I would love to see better glass as well. Full spectrum glass, that might be a challenge, but old glass, still a massive improvement from the infrared perspective. But Scott, thank you so much. And your website, your lighting company, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is Nira, N-I-R-A, lighting.com. So folks can check out your really cool light fixtures um, that are more full spectrum combination of the filament and the LED. True full spectrum. Not Come on, don't give me this garbage. Right. None, um, of this, none of this, <laughs> I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to say second fiddle to anybody. We have the broadest spectrum out there, bar none. So there. <laughs> the best, best, best damn light on the internet, folks. But, <laughs> but it, is it back in stock? Is yep. it back in stock? Yep. We're, I up and, we're up and we're up and making. For, okay. Yeah. All you have to do is you have to Amazing. just be patient enough for me to, to solder it together. We're we're the only uh, general service lamp manufacturer in the U.S. at this point, as far as I know. <laughs> so, yeah, we put it together in our in our basement, basically. That's so incredible. Check it out, folks. I'm going to check it out tonight before they're gone because I've been wanting to get some for my family and it makes a big difference. So, Scott, thank you. We really appreciate your work so much and looking forward to staying in touch. Well, thank you. I appreciate the time.